Good evening and welcome to Chlorine Calhoun. This is our Chlorine News Bash. I am Jada Marie Sidano of Torpedo Swim Team. We are streaming live on the Facebook and YouTube pages of Trimbago Freestyles and the Facebook pages of Move Lang, Sydney and Boston and the Center of Excellence Swimming Pool Complex. Remember to follow us, like the pages and share the live. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by searching Trimbago Freestyles. In the headlines, Assad hosts Junior Panam Trials. Asia Joseph selected as strength and conditioning coach for CPL. Water polo fearing champions and the life boy. And now our query news splash. The Amateur Swimming Association of Trinidad and Tobago hosted long course trials for the Junior Panam Games. With the qualification deadline being the 22nd of August, Assad held three days of trials from the 18th to the 20th of August as the national at the National Aquatic Center. This event was open to persons who already attained qualifying times for Pan Am. Nikolai Blackman, Malik Nelson, and Gabriel Bainu were the three athletes that achieved times at the trials in the 50-meter freestyle. Blackman also achieved the mark in the 100-meter freestyle. We await the final team selection to inform you of the final swim team for the Junior Pan American Games, which takes place from November 25th to December 5th in Colombia. In other news, you may have noticed strength and conditioning coach Asia Joseph missing, uh, missing in action in our Coaches Connection segment for the past couple weeks. We are pleased to announce that she was selected as the strength and conditioning coach for the St. Kitts and Nevis Patriots for the Caribbean Premier League Cricket Tournament, which starts on Thursday. Coach Asia is currently in St. Kitts, where she will work alongside the likes of Dwayne Bravo, Chris Gale, and Fabian Allen. We wish Coach Asa all the best in the tournament, but we still want the Trinbago Knight Riders to win. In Chlorine Kalalu news, Coach's connections come up next, and Coach Rocky speaks with 12 of our past Olympians on the value of learning to swim to the Olympic journey. Karen DeFrentalo Donahue and Shanta McLean join the discussion. At 8.25 p.m., we start chillaxing with Cindy Ann. This week, we have the Tokyo 2020 Olympic finalist, Portia Warren, who represented TNT in the shot put. Visualized chlorine champions will be prelude to our live voice segment, where we have some polo talk. First, we replaced some snippets of interviews last year with retired senior water polo players, Christopher George and John Littlepage. In our live voice segments, we have some more polo talk where we ask, can our senior water polo team compete on their world stage? Now retired from national duty, Little Page and George return and they will be joined by Ryan Smith, who was the manager of the TNT senior water polo team, as we attempt to find answers for the question. Thank you for tuning in to Korean Kalu and remember to like and share this live. Also, please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel of Trinbago Freestyles. I am Jada Marie Sidano and this was your Korean News Flash. Stay tuned. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, I assume Jason will be adding them now. So I'd like to introduce my panel for this evening. Uh, Karen Donahue, former Olympian, 1988. So, I mean, those who were viewing last week, you would have seen her husband. So exuberant. You know, seen her in the background as well. Right? Additionally, I mean, most of you all will know Chantel McLean, current coach, former Olympian, well, in Trinidad. Former Olympian 2004-2008, right? Um, good evening, Chantel. Good evening, Karen. How are you all? Good evening. Hi, Chantel. <laughs> Chantel, hearing us? I'm not hearing you now. No, I see in your lips moving, but I'm not hearing you. I mean, if you want to. Um, Leave and come back and I see. 
Hi, Karen. So, Hi. So, wait, Chantel, um, I know you are based in the States currently, right? So, I don't yeah. know how, I mean, I know your daughter still represents Trinidad, so you would still be in touch with what goes on locally, right? Compared right. to when you made Olympics, right? What would you say has changed if you have seen anything change in the structure of swimming in Trinidad? Have you seen anything? That's um, sort of well, yeah, I've been I'm out of touch with the last year and a half with COVID. So okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I know. So I, I really can't say what's going on currently. I know there's a lot of, you know, issues with just getting pool access, you know, so um, much frustration there. Um, um, but, you know, we, we're talking about learn to swim and um, the, the programs that I've seen over the years, uh, I just think that uh, more could be done. Um, and uh, especially with, you know, all the facilities that were built um, throughout Trinidad, I haven't seen all of them, um, but I've heard about the new pools in different communities. And um, I've also heard that they're underutilized. Um, so, and that, so, the, so the, yeah, so the, the facilities, the number of facilities available has increased. That's been a big change from when I was swimming. But it's, it's a shame to hear that they're not fully utilized. Okay, okay. All right, Chantal, I don't know if you heard the question I posed, right? No, I didn't. I was asking uh, Ms. Donahue if since her representation and since she was swimming for Trinidad, right, what or if anything has changed, she would say, in terms of structure, trying to bring about persons representatives to Olympics like yourselves, right? So, I mean, um, you currently on the floor working. I mean, what would you say has changed from then? I mean, is over 10 years. What would you say has changed? The um, I, I think when it, when I was swimming, in terms of the the pool of, of swimmers that were coming out from the non-competitive and into swimming, it kind of dwindled a bit um, during my period um, and afterwards. But coming down a little bit more, I guess, like from 20, 2010, 2012, coming coming forward, it started to see a lot more. Um, young swimmers getting involved in the in the sport, um, learning to swim and getting in the, the pre-competitive pre, pre has built, built up again. But in terms of the structure, um, I don't think there has been much change. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, I want to thank persons who have tuned in this evening. I'm not sure if I introduced this segment, actually, Coaches Connection, right? I mean, we this evening, as Mrs. Donner, you mentioned, we want to discuss learning to swim, right? <laughs> I mean, I would watch not just Learn to Swim, but the synergies of Learn to Swim branding and getting up into competitive. I would watch um, high school meets, right? And I would watch the standard of swimming Chantel, right? Some mm -hmm. of these are persons we should have been able to retain in swimming, right? You would watch even primary school meets, and I'm like, why aren't you? You would talk to the parents, and they're just not interested, right? Yeah. How, how do we now rebrand our products? That talent, I mean, talent isn't everywhere, but we do have talent in the country. How do you think we could try to rebrand ourselves to be able to pull these persons instead of them trying to go elsewhere and just enjoy football, but really have their talent in our sport? How do you think we could get about this? Shantan, I'll start with you. <laughs> um, that would start, I would think, that would start with all involved in, in, in the sport in terms of re-educating themselves, um, getting getting a bit more, doing a bit more research on, on the changes that have occurred across the globe in terms of um, with the sport, how it is they have been developing, sport has been developing, um, not just with the sport, um, not just with swimming, sorry, but on a holistic level, the development of children from, from as young as I would say, three, um, four, five-year-olds, yeah. all the way up to the elite level and, and stuff like that. There has been different changes. There has been a lot of um, uh, different new approaches that has gone on from both 
the athletic, the administrative, the coaching, the technical, there are a lot of changes that's going on. And I think that we have to start re-educating ourselves, redefining ourselves um, as, as investors or as shareholders, stakeholders within yeah. the sport. And that's where then it is you go and you, you know and we get familiar or sh of what it's going to take to make the changes to turn around to, to make the turn around for for this sport because we do have we have the resources we have the human resource we have the facilities we definitely have the facilities um so i think it's it's more the, the manpower that, that has to be you know we revamp ourselves redefine and reinvent ourselves and become more creative to to what what we want to establish as a, a country all right karen away how do y'all i mean your retention i mean you'll have a lot more persons i mean the number of persons learning to swim and the population away is far greater than here but you all seem to have a better handle on retention what did you say that you all, you think you all do that, we don't, that we have such a high dropout rate? Um, well, I was thinking, uh, for example, my children were born here um, and I wanted them to be involved in swimming. And um, there were programs available that were affordable. So I have a large family of five and how was I going to get them involved in a sport and be able to you know, like swimming and be able to afford it and, um, you know, know that this is something they wanted to do. So I, I, um, I was coaching them for a while on my own and then eventually put them in a, I taught them to swim, but, uh, so there's the learn to swim, swim part. First, we need to, um, learn to swim to introduce, you know, lots of programs and there are lots of opportunities, um, within the city. Uh, starting from Learn to Swim, and then I got them involved with uh, summer summer competitions yeah. that are, are, are free for for people living in the neighborhood, so that they could try out swimming, and it wasn't um, too much pressure. It was Legit. all about the fun, and the co city pools competed against other city pools. And at the, you know, there were probably five swim meets at the end uh, in total for this summer. And they had a championship at the end and, you know, a big celebration when it's finished. And see way to introduce them to the sport of swimming. And, and then fr from there, I could see other swimmers, other young people who had talent yeah. and then I would recommend them to a, a local team to be more permanent for year round swimming, things like that. So um, what I would like to see in, in Trinidad, especially with all the facilities that are available is to have more programs in place. Um, and at, at some of these pools that are accessible, even if it's just temporary on, on a summer basis, you know, for either from learn to swim or novice novice competitions. I, I don't know if if there's much going on, much of that going on right now. Um, so that's a you know that's something. Sounds good. Yeah, you know, as um as Karen mentioned in terms of the, the programs, what I was um I I thought about it, you know. The same way how we have the school system where they start, you know, the kids go into kindergarten, then they go into primary school, then they go into secondary school, and then off to hopefully university or they go um, off to, I guess, start their career. It's the same way we, should, um, we can structure our, our programs, our sport program, or the swimming program. You have them where they're starting off in nursery school. So it'll be like two, two to, I guess, five-year-olds, they start yeah. off in a, <clears throat> a certain level. And, you know, we don't, in school, you, you, you have to graduate or you don't allow the, the, the students to go to, on to the next level unless you find them competent enough Agreed. to go into that level. And to me, I see, see it as if we can mirror that system in terms of having levels and stages for these children, um, the, the kids, and we create that, I, I would say, that development pool 
And you, the way how you teach, you make sure that they have a strong, firm foundation before they can go and they build onto that going to each level. You get to primary school level, you have the assessments going on. When they reach into um, standard five, they have the, you have the SEA or whatnot, but yeah. you know, that could still be where they have um, the pre-competitive, they have a vast majority um, of, of, of learning that there's areas of learning that is going on. And that's what you do at, for the kids at those ages of development, stages of development. And when it is they go into secondary school from forms one to three, they have, um, they're there to get so many subjects, 14 subjects. And then it's only when it is, you know, they come to, when they reach 15 and well, 50, the age from four to five, or um, to six, then they start to pick what they want to be doing okay. as yeah. their desired um, choice. And, you know, they, they focus on, and zone in on, on that area as they want to. And I think that is something that can be um, applied for, for us in, in sports. As they call it. I would love for that to be, Chantel. However, I mean, you know, well, that's what I do on a daily outside of COVID, right? And <laughs> We try to implement that system. Two is lovelier, but two flaws or hindrances, I would say, we have seen with that are one, teachers, they have to go through training to become teachers for the most part, right? Uh, yeah. there, are, there are some daycares that will take persons and they try from there. But teachers have to go through certification and processes to show their worth, so to speak. As a learned system instructor, I mean, let's be real. Asker can't cut it because somebody could do your asker for you. You leave asker and they know why it's so than you were before. It doesn't really focus on stroke development. And what is fun in swimming now? So that is one point. I find most instructors fall short in that. And two is that the, and I'm going to be blunt. I think in school, it's nice where children can be under their teacher with all the parents overlooking. Right? <laughs> when you come to swimming, most times the parents are there. And the parents want the quantitative over the qualitative. So the parents, you would see them there. And if the instructor doesn't give one set of yards, they feel like they're wasting the money. Right? And that is one of the major things I wanted to discuss. I mean, you get from your perspective, Chantel, and Karen's, because Karen is away. And as she just mentioned, they stress on fun. However, Chantel, you have seen down here, if you do what you know is best as a coach, you get a lot of opposition from parents, right? Because they find, but wait, Chantel, you didn't do, look at, that's all you do today. Them children are smiling, they come out, they're tired, and they want to feel like they get to work too over. That is, that is what they think is a good session, right? So how do we know, because I think it, it, that's a big, big part of the problem. Parents wanting, not understanding what is development, and they want you to forsake certain aspects of development. So I started with Chantel just now. Karen, yes. right, as a parent over there, right? Yeah. I mean, you will hear coaches say that parents still come down. Uh, what age do you say you all really start mileage and gearing towards, hey, you know what? Let's do training to become a swimmer. Um, well, I I would, I mean, not it, the, le the level of uh, mileage uh, I, I didn't want to push them too early on um, because they get burnt out, but I wanted to make sure that they had the right technique as far as my children. And I, I feel it's important that they, uh, you know, all the basics down and then they can always build on the extra training. I had them in multiple sports so that they, they had different skills, but they were also in shape, getting conditioned in that way. Um, but I would say about age 11 or 12, you really oh have God. to <laughs> no, put... everyone, them six and seven. <laughs> no, that is, that is crazy. And that, that changed from when I was swimming in Trinidad because six on seven, we were out playing in the field and then running in to do a race and then going back and playing catch again, you know, all yeah. night long. Um, and it was it's just too much pressure. That's probably why some people, some ch children or youths maybe shine away from it because the, the joy of it might be taken of out. Of course, of course. So, 
And I would say parents not allowed on pool deck. So um, that is a, a, a policy for many swim teams here. Um, and it's just, you know, it's the parents input is important, but not on a daily basis when, when you're dealing with training of the athlete and, you know, the present state of mind or the present shape that that particular child is in, you know, at that moment, you know, and screaming and yelling or whatever, you know, or feeling like it's not enough may not be what that child needs that day. It may be just working on the breathing or, you know, the kick or something really specific that only the coach would know, you know, yeah. in their journey. So, yeah. um, but, but, uh, I just want to say, I think you said, how do we um, get, you know, more more done with the swimming and, and the promotion of it and, and the love of it or, or get more yeah. people excited about it? I think um, just getting information out, like Chantal was saying, um, and that's why I don't know the best way, but th this way is, yeah, this Chlorine Callaloo is a great um platform for that but on a but on a, on a regularly regular basis asset or some other website should be should be able to be a resource for parents you know um where they can go and just find things they could you know learn about you know as far as conditioning or um training programs things like that um and 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 promoting how yeah, athletes have been doing over, from Trinidad doing over the period of time. Yeah, the, the specific ages that's appropriate for training. Yeah. I mean, uh, you would see a lot of countries, they have going towards the long-term athletic development frameworks. And I mean, I think a lot of parents don't understand what that is. They think, hey, you know what? You playing, I'm going to work hard. So that means I will have a couple of years on you. But it's not about mileage as we allude to is about quality because if you have that wrong technique with plenty yards is more problems more bad than good and injuries possible injuries oh let me do even go there that's the next discussion chantel yeah what do you think about how you think we could try and change this culture girl where parents i mean they spend any money yeah so we still yeah. have to please them or they will go somewhere else um well it, it depends on, and, and I would, as I said before, in, in the early with um, re-educating yourself as coaches, as administrators and whatnot. And in that sense, it, it kind of reinforces the coaches for their confidence and for them to be able to let the parent know, listen, this is where your child is at at this current stage. But if I, I, as a coach, I'm looking towards longevity of that child in the sport. If it is that they want short-term results and they want like get fast now, then I'm I am sorry, but I'm that is not going to be the aim. As Karen said, technique at the different levels. Technique is something that's going to run throughout. No matter if you reach when you reach the elite level, it's going to run throughout, and it should be of, of, of paramount importance when it is at each stage of development for that child. And um, however, like um as uh, Karen was saying, with when the, the kids come in, at, uh, she said that she didn't start them with mileage until 12 and whatnot. Uh, for me, it's it's hard now because kids are very dormant. These mm -hmm. kids now, they're inside, they're on their, their devices and stuff, so they don't play. So you have to develop their athletic um, abilities first and get that in a gear, well, get them to know how to move, how to jump, run, you know, react. And... You, from there, you build in an athlete. Then it is you let them specify and go into what sport they have decided, swimming, football, running, whatever sport. You get them to that, that level of competency in being an athlete, and then you get them into a specific sport that they, they do like. For example, um, I, um, I took my kids on the beach and um, for training, open water, swimming, what um, fun, not training, but open water to get when you do maracas of course have open water and what i did before to kind of break the monotony and get them going a little bit we played a game of scooch 
A simple yeah. game of scooch. Get them dodging, get them on the stand out to throw. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be throwing. You're going to be reacting because you don't want that ball to sting you. Yeah. You're going to be moving very quickly. Yeah. So you're developing there, but you are having fun at the same time. Yeah. Now, these kids will not, some of these kids don't even know what scooch is. Yeah. Well, let's be playing it. So you have to explain the game to them first and then. You know, once they get into it and they get comfortable and then they start, you'd see them transform it during the game. And then you, you can even explain to them, you know, like this year, what it is you're doing. This is how it applies to what it is you're doing training, how it is when it is you're going into your race. You know, these are the different aspects that are being developed whilst you are doing this. You're having fun. And these are kids are 12, 13, 14. So it's, it's really difficult with... um. With, with the crop that we have now, it's not impossible, but we have to develop that athleticism first before we go into the specific sport um, for them. Agreed. I mean, as I wrap up, I, I just hope that, I mean, yes, we believe in these things, but there are persons who don't. So we just had to get one band, one song. So where are yeah. we going to that? Because if persons don't believe we do any right thing, they will go somewhere else that's doing the wrong thing, but it's easy to paint brass and make it look like gold, right? We have to let the caterpillar go its full term before it becomes a butterfly or it will not become a butterfly by you trying to help it, right? So I want to thank you all, viewers, for tuning into Coach's Connection. I mean, we might sound redundant, but the old way isn't working. We have to find synergies and get built from the base up. All right, as Rashad T.I. Yeah, say, when you tree young and you bend it wrong, it's hard to straighten when it's old and strong. All right, thank you, Chantel. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, thank up you. next, we have Chillaxin with Cindy and Olympian Porsche Warren. Right, thank so you. stay tuned you. and enjoy. Take care. Nice. Good evening and welcome to Chillaxin. I know I've been, I know it's, I know for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I am your host, Cindy Ann Boisso, and welcome to Chillaxin. That's right. This is the part of the program where you relax, you grab something to drink, a glass of water, a cup of tea, you know, you could put something in it, you know. And we just relax and, and, and we have fun conversations with fun people. And tonight, joining me is first time Olympian. And she competed in the shot put, Portia Warren. Oh. Live. Portia. Oh, Listen, let me tell you. Let's, let me just go straight to it. The reason. I'm not hearing you. I think your volume went. No. Hello? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. I say you're making me feel a good blood. Listen, Again. let me explain. Let me explain to you and to everybody else who's watching why the wig. Because usually I don't do it. But someone said that you once went to uh <laughs> to some games and you had like five different wigs i'm like okay i am i, I am coming out is that true i did it was <laughs> i saw like so like anytime we have like a big championship or something what i used to always do while i was in college like depending on the meet and how much days the meet is that's how much wigs i might go walk with well, so let me tell you, this, this is time. the only mm -hmm. wig i have this is it this is it. You know you can dye. You know you can, you can dye it if you want using um roots, right? Or cool. I'll or or turmeric. I'll send it to you after the show, and you'll dye it for me. So let's get to <laughs> business, proportions. Thank you for joining us. And um, you no live a problem. Mm -hmm. Why Alabama? Why Alabama? Because what? Because you know sometimes when it is you want to go place, you're going away from home, especially leaving your family behind, and you want right. like. Wherever you go, you want that place to feel like family or feel like you belong. You don't want to be like a fish out of water. And when I came on my visit to Alabama, it just felt like family. 
Oh, really? Everybody felt like family. It felt like home. And it had, it had some trend I didn't see it too. But not just that, but the atmosphere felt like an atmosphere I can be successful in. I'm sorry if I seem and to I be into it. myself tonight, eh, but it's the wig. I'm sorry. Let me focus. <laughs> You're, if, if I'm you listening. Like that. I'm if, listening. If you like that, I'll be passing in front of me. I'll be like, oh my God, is that me? And I walk back. I know, right? Listen, but yeah. like, yeah. And like the slogan, the slogan at IUA was like, where legends are made. And like stepping on the campus, you feel like if it is your, your body being a, a place where legends are made, you're going to be a legend or something. Or not just that. And I realized that through my visit, it wasn't just a place where legends were made, but a place where family is built and formed. Mm. And it's kind of like a, um, a, kind of a place that you feel proud to say that I belong there, I went there. Okay, I like that. So, shot put. I mean, you told me you started doing this at nine years old. And I don't mm. know if you were listening earlier. They were talking about Scooch. And I'm like, probably people saw you on a team for Scooch. And they were like, I'm out. If Porsche is <laughs> playing, I'm not playing. Tell me, shot put, what got you started? Nine years old? So, the funny thing, right? I was actually running first. So, I had run the 100. Didn't make it in the 100. For people who know me, they don't have like a knock me. So you should have seen my, me and my little bull like a tail <laughs> coming down that hundred meter. And like I realized, like, I don't know if it was just young, that age, but I realized like certain things you can do as a troll, you can do as a sprinter. As a sprinter, they can't eat 30 minutes before the race, 40 minutes. As a troll, I can eat before my before I go to troll and still be fine. And I love to eat. But it was just like so. so I went and I think that I, they didn't have the shot for the last. I think I went into the shot for that last minute, and I picked up the ball on shoot. I didn't understand how to throw it. I think Miss Riley, one of the officials, who was there, she showed me or something, and I threw the ball. I was like, mm. okay. So I started off with seven meters, and I made the team for that. Then after that, I added on the cricket ball. This I won a gold medal at that meet in the both events. And then I went to see the games again. I think it was in 2012 and St. Kitts. Was it? No, 2010, 2010 or 2008. One of those. I think it's 2008 because it was my first year of high school. Okay. So it's 2008. And I got silver. They cheat me. I'm going to say they cheat me. And I since after then, I had stuck for a while because I was, I used to live up countryside. For those who from Trinidad, Countryside is like it's who not from Trinidad is like it's Toko. So if it is you look at the map, Trinidad map, the place at the peak peak up there, that's where it is. I'm from from the east coast. And the North place east that coast. is located possibly in a different country, that is countryside. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to get up at four o'clock in the morning to go to school, so I didn't really have time to train then. Yes, I used to get four o'clock in the morning. I used to reach back home at like six, seven thirty in the night, and I would do homework, and then I would go straight back to sleep. Sometimes I only get two hours of sleep. I'm, I'm breaking my neck in the maxi going down to school, but I never, I never, you I never showed her, I never looked tired. Yeah, because it challenged me to be a better person. It just challenged me to be different, and I really appreciated that. So let me touch very quickly on strength or. Mm -hmm. Physique, what's more important in, in short put? Jeez and ages, what just happened? Okay, you're back. My phone just fell. It yeah. had a little bit. So would you say um, that the short put is more strength or is it more? I'll, I'll say it's it's about, it's it's kind of like equal part channel technique because I mean, it can be it can be weak to, to throw a, um, a, a four kg ball or in the men's case, a seven kg ball. You have to have some form of strength. But it takes technique and the right amount of agility and coordination. Because you need to be able, because like weight, like no matter what technique you use, there always needs to be some kind of like form of separation. Right. So you need to make sure you're coordinated enough to like to bring in that separation or the, whatever technique you're using. Me. That's not going to be a sport I would ever be interested in. I am very <laughs> uncoordinated. <laughs> Porsche, you told me one of your coaches um, was Joyce Thomas. And let me tell you, yes. Joyce Thomas was my PE teacher in St. Francis <laughs> Girls. We, we spoke about this at some point. <laughs> and I remember going to St. Francis when I said a word that I should not have said in high school. Well, in secondary school. And 
Mrs. Thomas made me rinse my mouth with soap water. Water. With soap water. Um, what type of person was she as a coach? As as a one-on-one? -on -one? Um, yeah, I did a one on one. All I used to like was me, this next, our next girl named Shauna and Maria. And I came and like we used to train together, but I had one or two times I had like one on one. She, she, she was really good. Yeah. She was patient. Yeah. She was patient and she believed in me. She saw my ability sometimes and things I didn't see it. And she made sure that I, I found the space or in within my little brain to, to see that as well. Yeah, she was, she was really, strict, but she I, had that passion. I agree. A beautiful mm, person. Even self, like sometimes when it is like, say, for example, when I was in form six and I needed certain books, she would buy the books and stuff for me. Sometimes, like, if it had one or time, I didn't have money to go to practice or something, she would give me money to read on the practice and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. always, always. A, I mean, when I rinsed out my person. mouth with the soap, I was angry in that moment, but I was mm -hmm. happy because she was really a beautiful person. So let's go mm -hmm. to Tokyo 2021, your first time qualifying for the Olympics. Um, not your mm -hmm. first time at all at an international level because you've medaled for us. You were the first silver medal you brought home for Trinidad and Tobago in the sport. Yeah, the World University Games in um, um, yeah, Italy. So now you're on your Olympics, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what was that like for you? Um, and how difficult was it for you to focus on, on just being there for the Olympics and not to sightsee? I always ask people that when they go abroad for, for, for sports. Mm -hmm. Because you have to focus. You have to forget all the food, the arts, the, the culture. You're here for a purpose. And, as, as, and especially with, um, I think that I'm, some part of me is like, I was at the Olympics, but I don't think I've truly grasped grasp how big of a skill in my career that have been to even set like not just be at olympic but make it into the finals because not much people because i was i was telling you earlier because there's a lot of past olympian olympic champions who don't said make the country's team and i didn't just make the team i made it into the finals and that was a huge accomplishment in me and it kind of opened my eyes and it it boosts my confidence heavily and i mean like one thing that i've always done especially like going into like these different meets and stuff like that is working on my ability to adapt and know that this is not a vacation i come here this is just business so anytime i'm going abroad to compete or something and somebody asks me hey what what are you doing i say oh i got a business trip and mm -hmm. like i will tell them why i'm going i'm like i told one of my friends i'm going to talk she's like oh are you going on vacation no ma'am it's not vacation and especially with covid when i tell you i was in that tokyo i was hand sanitizing my hand my nose <laughs> everything was getting hand sanitizer. When I tell you everything was getting hand sanitizer, everything. everything. Like even stuff like we will go up the escalator and I will legit stand on the tension because I dare not touch those railings. Mm -hmm. And I know why it is I would have loved to sightsee in Japan because it looked like such a if you see how clean they look. Really? I've it's heard so I've clean. really I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah, so like I would have really liked to say, I mean, I'm gonna just look at some videos online and just be like, oh, I wasn't talking. I couldn't go see that if I wanted, but <laughs> not really, but because we had a lot of limitation and stuff. I and know. And protocols to follow, yeah. And this is your first time in the Olympics, and we never got to the podium. Tell me how that felt for the team. What was what was the mood like for the team for you? You know, did you feel disappointed? So, so I end up, I end up actually leaving before the whole game's done. So I didn't get a chair on and lose my voice in the four by four and stuff like that. Right. But what a lot of people doesn't realize, it takes a lot to be an athlete. Not just to be an athlete, but to be an elite level athlete. And right. what they don't understand is, yeah, Trinidad and Tobago went to the games and they didn't medal. But yet still, we still showcase Trinidad and Tobago to the world. Everybody that made it to a final, everybody that went on to a different row somehow gave some kind of level of advertisement in terms of not just tourism or letting people know that people who don't know about Trinidad and Tobago that Trinidad and Tobago exists. Exactly. But, I mean, the, the games had no fans whatsoever. And so everybody was basically just look, glued to their TVs. So when they announced, announced okay, Jim Richard, Trinidad and Tobago, Porsche's from Trinidad and Tobago, Target is Trinidad and Tobago, Dion Lender, Trinidad and Tobago, to name a few, everybody said, oh, Trinidad and Tobago, let me Google this. 
Right. And now, now, now they're, they're even self getting more informed about what Trinidad and Tobago is. So uh, we, uh, all the athletes that went out there shouldn't feel disappointed or people shouldn't be disappointed them, but more so encourage them. Because look, when I went to my first World University Games in 2017 in Taiwan, I came 12th. I threw 15 meters, 15.05. That's how much I threw. That was in 2016. Now, fast track in 2019. I took that defeat. I learned from that loss and I came back and I was able to get a podium finish. I came, I came second. Right, exactly. I went from 15 over to 17, 7 or whatever it was. But the, but the point of the matter is, I don't give up on myself. And if I believed in this, oh, she got quite tight. You want to throw 15 or this, and then, yeah. If I believed then, then I would have left my journey end there. But I still, still let my losses propel me to more success and propel me to be the better athlete that I am. So, Am I disappointed? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm happy because I went to Tokyo and did a personal best. There's a lot of athletes who went there, did season best and stuff like that. And there's a lot of athletes who went there and gave the all of what they could have did in that moment. And that's all mm -hmm. we should ask for. Yes. Well said. And well said. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Now, um, it takes a lot for us to get to the world stage, to the Olympics, to any international mm -hmm. sport. Um, It takes money funding how do you feel about mm. that what's your what's your perspective on who should fund athletes are you more do you think it's a corporate job or do you think it's it's something the government should do i i, I mean it should be uh it should be a relationship between the two where they should have like because i know it has certain countries that have foundations in place for just like athlete development it shouldn't just be the ministry of sport because when, 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 or, or just the governing body, because when an athlete go there and win a medal, it's not the not saying, oh, um, Jeremy Richard representing the ministry of sport, it's not that. They're saying this athlete is representing Trinidad and Tobago. Therefore, people who in Trinidad and Tobago who have businesses should therefore invest because this is an opportunity for you to gain business for your company, for your business. Because people are going to be you now coming in. They mm -hmm. want to see what this hall is hides and this attraction about. A lot of people talk a lot, but they don't put their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. Not all. If it is a lot, a lot of people, the same amount of effort they are taking to, to scrutinize or buy talk an athlete. Okay, every time you buy talk an athlete, get them pay two dollars in a in a, in a fund or something. Listen, I love you that. You can back talk however you want. Well, donate since you want to back talk, donate to back talking. So at least we get paid or whatever. <laughs> For, for the embarrassment that you're somehow saying that we are bringing to you. Why is this we are out there? Why are we there out there risking our mental health, risking our body because we put our, because mind you, we only get one month off. Right. So while we're doing all this and you, you'll be coming on Olympic fan a week before the Olympics, sitting on your couch, scrutinizing athletes who are putting their blood, sweat and tears trying to, to fly their country's flag. Put your money where your mouth is and put it in a fund or something and say, okay, this is towards the acting. So hopefully next time when, when Paris 24 come up, they'll have better resources, more financial support. So they can not just take care of themselves physically, but mentally also, because a lot of people don't realize that this sport is becoming more mental each year, each month, each day, each second. Yeah. Okay. So I know you love to speak in different accents. Here's what I want you to do for me. You are, before we get to the accents, you are launching your own facial cream brand. Is that it? Yeah. What is it mean? You see the face? Look at it. Look at it. Let's see. Look at it. But are, you are you seeing the face? Are you seeing it? Flawless. Flawless <laughs> in its entirety. I tell you. <laughs> hey, what you they, they'll be like, my friend, what? what I, I know when a lot of people ask you, what are you doing? I say yes, I drink water, but I also use my stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now, what accent was that? Poor shots, watch That's that. Nigerian. That's Nigerian. All right, so take us out, because we have to end the program, sadly. We've come to mm -hmm. an end. I want to first, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Thank you for no giving problem. me the opportunity to, you know, step out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. to, you know, come out like the, the they call me Marilyn Monroe, all kind of fanciness, mm -hmm. right? Um, how can people follow you and support you? You guys, you guys can follow me on 
IG and Portius 102 is P O R T I O U S 102. I just type in the name because I don't, you know, some people like to use all those kind of like old fancy name. It's just my name. Facebook, Portius Warren. On YouTube, Island Cupid or Porsche World. I'll be having some gems. Okay. I'll and if on. you guys want to get your skin as flawless as mine, shop islandcupid.com. <laughs> <Her>. <laughs> Portia, this was a joy. I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to congratulate you. Keep going. Keep thank that you. fire burning. We wish you all the best. And um, follow me on Instagram at Cindy Ann Boisso. And stay tuned for our next um, segment coming up is uh, Chlorine Chronicles. And they are going to do some rebroadcasting of past interviews. So take care. Bye. Bye. Chlorine champions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen.
Good evening and welcome to the live voice segment. We had some little technical difficulties with that previous video. So um, we're going to get into the next segment that we had shared, which is with John Stanley Little Page, um, Christopher George, and Ryan Smith. We're discussing water polo and discussing if we can get onto the world stage in water polo. So thank you for tuning in to Chlorine Carlo right here on Trinbago Freestyles on um, Facebook and YouTube Live. Um, we're still waiting on Christopher and Ryan to log in, but I have um, John Stanley, Little Page, holding on in the back. I forget he's not John Stanley anymore. He's just John Little Page. You dropped the Stanley? Yeah, it's still there, but you grow out of some things. You grow out of your kidneys. Good evening. And how have you been? Where in the world are you? I'm back in Trinidad now, so oh, you're back in happy Trinidad. to be home, minus the lockdown, but happy to be home. Minus the lockdown. Which part of the lockdown? The, part, the sports lockdown or everything? The part that closed down pools. I was still I was still being quite active in the pool, and they came down and shut that in. Happy that we can at least run on the road and everything right now and, and get outside. I have two little boys now as well, so walking around the neighborhood is also a big help, so. Coming right. from Houston, where they had no, really no rules around lockdowns, it was, it was, a, it was a big change coming back to that. All right, so I still, I'm going to get on to Chris and Ryan to get them to join on on the broadcast. But this is the segment we call the Life Boy Saving Aquatics, one guest at a time. Well, we don't have one guest this time; we have three, hopefully. So hopefully, we could make some um, headway here in this discussion. And I mean, a lot of times we neglect to talk about water polo um but uh, water polo is a part of the whole aquatics uh, family um so while we're waiting on the others to come in um we question what is it about water polo why water polo for you well that's a, that's a tricky one i mean it came i've been playing water polo since maybe 11 or 12. Um, i used to be in tandem with swimming in my last segment, I would have mentioned that I wasn't always the best age group swimmer. And I gravitated towards water polo as, as I was performing slightly better in that. And then my swimming started to catch up, maybe with the multiple training sessions between swimming and polo, putting in that extra work. Um, I, I started to make my first national teams in water polo. Um, it's a completely different sport in terms of swimming where you get that camaraderie, you, you actually have that. I mean, that team environment, I mean, when you're ruling in water and you're, you're sweating with your, your brothers, essentially, that you're also allowed to talk to them. I mean, in swimming, it's different where your goggles are on and you're staying at the line for a lot of the time. Um, yes, you have your bands on your wall and you're, and you're racing going on, but in terms of just fighting and sweating and, and essentially going to battle with your teammates, and that was is something completely different. Is a, is a whole different spectrum of the aquatic sports. So, Ryan, how, Ryan Smith, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Possibly. Okay. <laughs> so, good, good evening. Time. Good evening, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Corinne Carlo. And how, for you, why do you love water polo? Well, I got involved in water polo uh, when I came back from university, actually. And I, it was very new. At the time for those involved, um, we're getting it back started in, in Trinidad. It was new to Trinidad, I should say, or revamped. So it was new for this generation. And I just got involved and saw them, you know, struggling. They, they went through struggles. And I said, you know, I, I would like to help because the, the sport seems like an interesting sport, the team. And then it's, 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 it's a likable sport. So I just fell in love with it after that. Right. And how did you start... in, in secondary school as well? And how did how did you move from just loving this sport to being this administrator to being an administrator? Well, uh, there's the need. Most of the people involved just wanted to play, so I decided. By the way, good evening, John. I don't think I, I greeted you. Um, I hope all is well. Uh, so, I, so I I noticed the need. Everybody wanted to play. They want, all right. wanted to, to, to play water polo. Nobody wanted to focus on, you know, developing and, and taking it forward. So 
back in like uh let's see it was around 2000 i would say you know we go um we want to go to cisc it was at the point in time and we say okay well you know asat you know we would like to represent the country in water polo have a team you know but it was really only swimming in asset at that point in time and um we got a lot of a lot of stick as they would say you know yeah. to, to to go why should we send a team what what training have you done you know a lot of questions valid questions um there was just one club basically training at the time or one set of people training at the time and they went to represent uh trinidad and tobago in well before I came on board, it was in 1998, but in 2000, we went to Aruba. So I got involved like that. And then I said, when we came back from that tournament, I said, well, we shouldn't have to go through this every every two years because the feedback that I was getting was that every time we have to go to represent the country, it's always, you know, a difficulty and say, why should we send a team? And And I decided that we had to make things, we had to change things so that Asat would want to send a team, not just us wanting to go and, you know, represent the country and get the sport going. But Asat would actually want uh, a team to be to represent the country. So we started having, you know, competitions that we didn't have before. We introduced it into the secondary schools um, and and we took it from there. And we, we had uh, little um, five aside competitions and so on so that people saw that Things were happening in water polo. It wasn't just the CISC every two years that we say, okay, let's come together and put together a team for that. Show them that we are doing something. We're in training and we're competing so that we can, you know, get better in this sport. And John, as you um, went along your career in water polo, because I know when we spoke last time, you used to go with your father to Blue Dolphin Swim um, Club and rough it up for the older guys. How have you seen, how, how have you felt like going to the age group that was there more opportunities presented to water polo than it used to have in the past yeah so I, I started close to that beginning i mean my first national team was 2002 so this would have been i guess the third cisc after asat the sanction a national team to go uh, but i was probably in that good dolphin school from around that 2000s 1999 and i mean definitely now through out i mean i, I was still up part of the national team up to 2017. Um, you saw, I mean, vast improvements. I mean, it, it was, uh, Peg and okay, can we get sanctioned for this to, uh, okay, you have a bunch of people coming out, you have different clubs, and you're actually trying to compete for a spot on these national teams. And I mean, we also went from whipping boys in these tournaments to winning most, a lot of these Caribbean regional tournaments. So we saw, vast improvements and I would attribute a lot of it to a lot of the work that Ryan's done. I mean, the, I was part of the first secondary schools game. So when, when those started, I was probably in form three or form four. And I mean, it was, it was competition and it's, it's something that we lacked in Trinidad. We used to have these into Island where, okay, yes, we go to Barbados, we used to go to Curacao, they would come to Trinidad. And a lot of that has actually gone away. So I think we, we had a peak. And during the same, in, in my lifespan of Trinidad World Polo, it's also experienced a semi-regional decline as well, which is a, a challenge that I hope we could overcome and, and continue to grow. And then I know one of the senior team, it was a senior team that went to the FINA Youth Development Trophy competition. Right, you are part of that team as well, John, correct? Yes, yes. I, I was part of the first one in Kuwait when we won bronze. And then, unfortunately, I skipped the, the follow-up in Saudi Arabia due to schooling commitments. So let me ask you the question now, John. And you, you could do it simple, yes or no, I don't know. Um, can Trinidad and Tobago um, compete on the world stage in water polo? And, and I think it's a loaded question. Um, I think after three can in terms of we have the talent out there and we have individual athletes that have represented we had players playing in professional leagues in holland we have people that won accolades in, in the collegiate circuit at the top um top schools um but do i think we're going to get there on this current trajectory no i think that it's far-fetched i think we do require 
a lot of investment. It is going to require. John, let, 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 let me don't go into what we need yet. We'll get, we will get there. Okay. We'll get there. Because <laughs> I know yes. you, might have a, you might have a list. And yeah. Brian, I, would, I would say yes, we, we have the talent, but on the current trajectory, it, it's world class stage. I don't see it right now. Ryan, same question. Uh, yes, I agree with John totally. And yes, my list will probably be longer than John's own. So yes, we do have the talent here. Uh, it's not an easy path to get to Olympics, particularly for, for the men. Uh, the women may have a little bit um, easier um, path to get to Olympics. However, is a lot is a lot that needs to be done, um, including the mindset of a lot of the athletes as well. Eh? Um, some of the athletes don't believe some of the better athletes don't believe that we will ever get there that we can get there um so it's a it's a mindset some of the athletes don't feel that we will ever get the support to get there as well so so it's it's a kind of yes and no at the same time before we get to the support uh, let me just i'm uh, being practical let's just do the the, the numbers game mm -hmm. i mean i was gonna say trinidad is this little dot with very limited amount of people even playing water polo and you go to these bigger world-class countries, um, bigger countries that have these, this wide pool of talent. Even with the talent that we have now, you believe, and I'm not even talking really Olympics to say, but competing at CAC and Panama and meddling at those games, with the current crop of people we have available, do you think we could get there? Uh, we could definitely get there. Um, CAC games uh, easier. We've qualified for Pan Am Games, as you know. Uh, so we, we, we're right there in CAC Games. We do um, need a little more push to get to the medal situation. In terms of Pan Am Games, yes, in order to get to the World Championships, to the Olympics, you need to medal at um, Pan Am Games at the very least to be able to get there as well. Yeah, and, and you need to go. Yes, we need to go. Yeah, yeah because I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I have not crystal log back on because I know to log on because I know that was part of his reason for changing his tra trajectory because he had mentioned in his interview last year that, you know, Pan Am for him, at least it was like a step to the Olympics and, you know, he felt that there was a, a team of persons that could have, I mean, they qualified him and for whatever reason, they weren't allowed to progress. So, how, how, what a, but I didn't know where to start now. Nah? John, you were part of that Pan Am team too that qualified? Or yeah, that so. And how was that? Say, how was I'll that experience to you? I'll go back to that previous comment you had, right? So if, if we would compete at the CAC level, so following that Kuwait trip where we won bronze, that the majority of that team went to the following CAC games, and that, that's the competition where we qualified for Pan Am. Right. I would say we were i mean that's the most competitive we've been at the essential american level I, I can't recall the year right now i guess that was around 2005 around there um but i mean that's when we, we had foreign coaches we had programs we had inter league competitions in, in the country there's, there's a lot of stuff around and we were really firing and all cylinders at that, that point in time um to get there now again i would say a, a big difference is how much competitions we play here and, and as part of the senior team since i left school we would probably play two tournaments every four years you'd play cc can to qualify for cac and then you play cac and then you have a two-year break and then you go back to cc can um and that that has been the story of senior water polo in trinidad over the last number of years um and i mean when i was on the collegiate circuit or even when i just returned from houston i was playing four games every other weekend for a four month period or five month period. So it's just that level of games and you had seen all these competitions, even the last ones where we weren't as competitive by the end of the tournament, we were being faced up with the teams that win and you're in, you're being competitive with that team. It's just shaking off that dust and getting those first couple of games out of the way. We are kind of starting off where we're now getting game ready and it's just all about match fitness and that is what we're lacking greatly in, in terms of being competitive. Ryan, I know, and I can't even remember if I introduced Ryan as the manager of the TNT senior water polo team. 
and he's also the manager of Roy Hill Seals. So, Ryan, um, in your opinion, um, what are, you can start with one thing. I'll throw it in your court first. What does, tell me one thing that you all need going forward to um, get what, to get um, the senior team to the world stage. There's one thing. Funding. If if, uh, if you say one thing, it's funding, because right. if with the funding, we can get the competition that uh, John spoke about, so that right. we can get that 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 level of competition that is so needed for athletes to be ready to compete at the lower levels to be able to get us to qualify for the higher levels. If we don't have the funding, and and the funding starts very basic, and then goes right up because the funding starts with just being able to train properly all right being able to have physios uh doctors and so on uh we have we have absolutely none of that right now all right so it's 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 a lack a total lack of funding that we we are expecting our athletes to try to somehow pull through without that and and john let, let me be a little devil's advocate do you all deserve, do senior water polo people deserve the funding? I have heard in the past that sometimes the seniors are not as committed as the juniors, right? Is that true? Is it that um, you all train together as you should? Or is that you all are not motivated to train? What? What, what is it? It's, I think it's a chicken and egg, right? They talk about are you motivated to train? And picture a team being together. I mean, go back to where Chris actually left the team in terms of you qualify for tournaments and then things are taken away you get disbanded so you, you were training for something and then all of a sudden there's no more target to to achieve and then you know that the next competition is two years out to say okay i'm now going to sacrifice mornings and afternoons for the next two years for something two years out um for a qualifying competition i mean it's tough and i mean you're talking about the senior the senior team being competitive, right? So, yes, we're the Amateur Swimming Association of Trinidad and Tobago, but you need to kind of stop treating it as an amateur level if you're trying to compete at these elite levels, right? It's almost you need to treat it as a as a professional sport and something that you're trying to target. Um, in terms of do we deserve funding right now? I mean, right now, I think we had a level where we kind of actually need to rebuild the sport. I mean, especially COVID, there was a couple of initiatives that took off with uh, Marlins had opened up to, to ex-national players and the better crops of the of the younger club teams and they were just scrimmaging. So people were getting back in the water and you actually saw a resurgence of the older guys coming back out. Um, just those kind of things of a place to train and and those fun games to kind of get people back interested. And in the end, when we were most productive in what pool and i'd say the youth team qualifying for world championships as well it is when our senior team is at the highest level so it, it, it kind of cascades down you have a good senior team it's competition for the junior team they get better it doesn't really benefit the senior team because again you're playing down a level while the juniors are playing up um so if you really want your senior team to, to grow you need to get them exposure and these constant games um, but right now, I, I would agree with you right now, funding right now, you, you'd have to make a hard case and, and you build a plan around it. And I'm not expecting a million dollars to come through. It, it's going to start with small funding, you start working your way up, it, it gains momentum and you keep building. But obviously, all sports are fighting for funding right now. Um, the, the country itself is in a, in a cash crunch. That's part of the reason why I say do I expect us to be competitive and it's it's a far fetch. Ryan, how how difficult a job is it for you to manage a senior water polo team to get that with these different challenges you have to get the, the level of commitment from these these are not the um young um teenagers that you have before. These are adults with responsibilities, etc. How difficult is it? yeah well as as john said it really is a, a chicken and egg all right because you know you don't feel motivated if you don't have the funding and then you don't get the funding if you don't have you know if you don't have a team but 
in terms of difficulty, um, Jason, understand this. The junior athletes are the ones who tend to get the funding, all right? Because it's easy. They are going to school. That's all their commitment is going to school and they come and train in the afternoon. They're having a good time. Senior athletes have a lot more to deal with. They have work, sometimes family, you know, some, you know, sometimes they have their, they, they're now getting married, they, they have a child on the way. So it's a lot of different things. And, and they don't sometimes, most of the times, they don't have the support of their parents like they would have when they were teenagers. So you make a national team and your parents may fund it. If you can't, if you don't get government funding, then your parents will, will fund it. All right. Um, well, most parents, um, at the senior level, that's not really happening because, all right, well, you know, you're an adult now. You have to find your money on your own, you know. Sometimes you don't even get time off from your job, all right, depending on where you're working to, to be able to represent the country. You might have right. to leave your job a little bit and take no pay, you know. So they, they really have it tough. So getting the commitment of of um, national players is, is, is really tough. And even with the, the training times, availability of pool time for training, also tough because you know they have some of them are working um some in university some are working and when they're working they finish their job at a certain time so the only time that they can get um to training is after work time so that also poses a challenge um we have the facilities in Cuba, all right but if you're working in port of spain on a regular day getting down to Cuba will probably take you too much time um, to be able to get them at a decent hour. So now you have to train later at night, which we've been doing, but it really isn't motivating the whole the scenario of everything that goes on as a senior water polo player. So, I mean, you, you spoke about the funding and you spoke about the things that you all need, right? So this is Ryan and John talking, but Ryan, you have sat on like the water polo committees, etc. So... It seems like you want national, um, the senior swimming, senior polo, sorry, to go forward. Is there a national plan or national vision for water polo at the level of the water polo committee? Well, the only national vision that you get for water polo, um, senior water polo will be from the manager. So, yes, the manager has a, a plan, but um, that's as it goes to the water polo committee. But, you know, it's almost as if, okay, well, the manager is responsible for executing that. It, I, it, remember, Asat is shared with other disciplines, all yeah. right? Um, so water polo may not always be the focus, all right? And, and, and more but, and more... But talking, I'm talking specific, not even council, I'm talking mm. specifically the water polo committee. Yeah. Is there, that say, is there saying, is it that the focus is only age group? Is it that, I mean, you try to get the senior going? It, what What is the... Is, well, in terms in terms of, of, of that water polo committee, I would say um, how it operates is generally on an as-need basis, basically. That is what has been happening. That would be my description of it, of as an, an as-needed basis. So you have a competition coming up. This is what we, we have to prepare for that competition. And a lot of times, no meetings take place because there's nothing coming up. So, for example, um, during this COVID-19 time, when a lot of planning could have been done, um, we have had one meeting, all right, um, just to get an update of if everybody's okay and stuff like that. And, and, and that is basically it. Oh, we did have an opportunity to represent um, at the World Championships, Junior World Championships, for the... Um, 20 and under, right? So we were able, we, we got a spot. I guess some of the countries pulled out. We didn't qualify um, originally, but because there were some vacancies, we got that spot. And that's why that water polo committee meeting was called, All right? But other than that, we've had no water polo committee meetings since the pandemic started. And I would have thought, you know, this is a perfect time, you know, that we can do planning, you know? Um, I've, I've suggested it. You know, we have some planning and we can do some restructuring to make sure we understand where we want to go, how we're going to do it, what things we can do differently so that we can do better when this whole pandemic is finished so that we don't do the same thing and, and get nowhere. Um, so if you're now tuning in, this is the Live Boy segment, Saving Aquatics, one guest at a time. And today we're talking water polo. John, um, Ashley Alonso, healing out here on the chat. So 
You can tell her back. You can tell her back if you want, but you don't have to. John, after I mean, you're an adult now, so well, yeah, adults are wild now. But hearing what Ryan has said, and now you you are a senior athlete. Um, how you feel about hearing that, that you know there hasn't been much discussion about water polo during this time? Um, does so? Do you think we could get to? Do you think we could get to the world, world stage? I mean, no, honest opinion, it's not surprising. I mean, it, it's the same battles we've been facing over the past couple of decades. So, um, time we get it, yes. But again, like I said, it is difficult. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle for funding, and you are competing with. I mean, ASAT is competing with the the rest of the sporting fraternities, and then within ASAT, you're now also trying to divert funds between water polo and swimming. Um, and I mean, again, I go back to that amateur in front of it. A lot of the people that serve on these committees are swimmers' parents, right? So it's volunteer positions. And you look at it, again, it's, it's now leaning towards, again, the age groups versus a, as a senior team because, okay, my children on this, I'm trying to fight to get as much funding and the development in there as well. Um, one thing I do want to say is, and touching on and, and where do we go age group versus senior and i think where we reach in Trinidad right now i think there is a gap between where we were at our peak and now there's, there's a gap in the senior team it's almost you know i need to rebuild again from the, the junior i mean my first water polo team was senior team was at 15 at PAC games they had rules kind of incorporated after that where you have to be a certain age to represent a senior team and you look at that rule and then you you just look at okay a messi or a neymar and what what age they represent uh a brazil in a senior world cup and i mean they give you excuses about oh it's, it's about protecting the younger talent but to me i mean a lot of us grew up in that time and it's probably the the stay awards in the in the sport i mean chris myself chris's brother um i mean it's a couple of 34 year olds who are still representing Trinidad at their senior level, a gap, and then some 25 year olds. Um, so I think, again, you bring that in, you get these younger people, they get as much competition, they get more, they can do the age group competitions, they get into the senior competition. So you have multiple competitions a year now, you can start getting that in. And you get them to develop the sport. Um, I remember coming back from university, it was always calling, okay, guys, let's come back together and, and train for something. Um, we, we need more of those again um, to, to really drive the sport and, and, and grow the interest. But I, I think one of the things, and I love you all could take this one, one of the things too that is a pet peeve of mine is that water polo is still a West sport. It's still a West based sport, as in you don't have, that's a very limited um, talent pool. Um, with, sometimes I like to say, what can we do without the government or without the association? For persons who love water polo, what, what, what can be done? Because, I mean, there are facilities all over. I mean, I run a facility, and Ryan and I have talked, and full time is an issue, but COVID may provide opportunity, you never know. But has there been, like, a, a, a drive to increase the base? So coming to Cuba might not seem so far, because it might be midpoint for everybody. Well, we actually have done that. We've done um, clinics uh, in Tobago in Point Fourteen in san fernando we've done it but unless there's follow up you know and you put someone in there uh a lot of people in the country don't know about water polo so if if it is that we have people who are only living in the west that are interested in coaching all right uh they're not gonna go uh, uh, into traffic to go to coach down you're, in not san gonna, you're not going to pass the light out well that too <laughs> but um some will some will because we have people living you know on the east west corridor who already living past the white the the, the lighthouse right? <laughs> so 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 we do look at getting in some of the programs but when we have that even though we have the coaches as you said full time not available so that is one of the challenges um that we have now Community pools has always been a discussion where we could try to get in there. Um, it's not ideal, but it's a possibility. But again, that itself uh, has a lot of challenges with it in terms of actually being able to get in there. 
right, to, to get it consistently. Sometimes down, and you know you have to scrap your program and then try to restart again. So we have there's a, there's a lot of challenges as a, you know, as we try to spread the the um the polo in the throughout the country. So is it that too we have to get and anyone could think is it that we now have to probably get direct buy-in from the Ministry of Sport or the sport company, um, private individuals probably making proposals etc. To see if we I mean I know. Sometimes going at the community pool is a risk based on what you said too, with who will be in up, who will be in down, things like that. Is that somebody has to make a direct intervention to get access there? Well, Jason, um, I don't like, what I don't can like, I, I don't like to leave here just talking. I like to get some kind of solution, some kind of idea, because right now, you know, I know how you feel. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> It starts from within. What can I say? It starts from within because had Water Polo been a separate organization from the Amateur Swimming Association, a lot more would have taken place. Let's, let's put it that way. So John can answer the rest of the question. He'll give his point if, you know, but I will, I will leave it at that. No, I, I would actually say I, I try to stay away from the politics in the sport. I, I got involved at one point um, in fighting for a team and, and that actually led to a temporary resignation before rejoining. But um, I mean, dealing with, with, with some of these and, and, and fighting for the, the case of water polo over swimming, I mean, you do face a lot of resistance. Um, in terms of growing it, yes, it would be great to grow. But again, with this history being primarily a West sport, the, the people that are here and the past players still do live in the West. And I mean, a lot of them have gone back to the pool and, and they have kind of taken up these coaching mantles in the, in the two clubs that are operating right now, um, Royal and Marlins. I mean, you, you do see the numbers in these clubs grow, but again, it would be nice to see something happening at a central and a south level. And, and even the schools league, I mean, I think from when it started to where it is now, they haven't been much new schools added to the i mean you can correct me if i'm wrong right i haven't been around the schools the schools league in a while but it hasn't had much growth beyond the i guess the the prestige schools in in, in the west the i think the form one division had a couple of extra ones but then it doesn't migrate to big school um big pool or school yeah what um what we also had was um the introduction back in 2005 of the primary schools league and they do mini polo so at least people got an introduction before they went into secondary school of what this sport is about so they went into secondary school and some of them were able to make the change over um and and do the water polo however a lot of these schools even though you may have more schools than primary school competing i mean primary school has also fluctuated in terms of the numbers it's gone up it's gone down um we have more schools generally that would have participated in primary schools league but mm. you also find that when they get into secondary school, because their school does not do the sport, that's that's it for them. You know, so you may have a few of them might join a club, but in terms of the secondary schools, they don't, um, their school doesn't take part. They try to encourage them. And sometimes you may get a, a one, a one school might come on for a year or a few years, and then they may drop back out. And then, I mean, normally, I know normally the school system, you have to have a teacher that is pushing it, right? Yes. As a big thing, you must have a teacher. But, yeah. I mean, it goes to a more national problem because, I mean, we like to complain when our athletes don't perform, but there are a lot of systems that are not in place. I mean, in schools, I mean, for example, with swimming, it's in schools, some schools don't swim or some schools aren't allowed to swim. Some schools swim. There isn't like a, a structured program, even for the, the swimming part of it. And to, to, to get the commitment from some of the schools, I know I know it is a challenge, but I mean, it, it requires a whole culture change, I believe. But I believe too, if collectively as an association we have we all sing in the same tune, but plenty of times we have a tune playing and everybody playing in different times timing, right? And it's not like there's a I don't feel like there's a national vision for swimming or water polo to be quite honest. I, I feel the same. Yeah. So what does it require? Is it that we need a whole revamp? I mean, I know they, they just, we spoke about 
um, revamping the constitutional asset? Is it that the swimming association needs to be totally revamped? Is it that we have to sit down and talk more, have more structured this um, discussion? Is it a leadership? What is it? I think I think it starts with well leadership. Of course, you start with the proper leadership and restructuring. I think restructuring is is critical to aquatics on the whole um, for it to survive going forward. Uh, we've seen that we. Even in swimming, Jason, you've seen where we performed better in years gone by, and that has declined. Uh, we yeah. may have a one swimmer now and then, you know, doing something good. But overall, aquatics has declined, has had a decline. And we need to do a restructure, and, and, and it, takes, it takes dialogue to do that, uh, so that so that people put their heads together and see how we can restructure to be able to better manage um, all the aquatic disciplines, all right? And, and we, of course, we have some aquatic disciplines that we didn't even touch on as yet, all right? Like diving and, and, and artistic swimming. But my, my thing is, if we can't get the ones we have already, we're going to add on two additional? Well, if we have the correct structure in place, then it makes it easy for the others to be added on, if we have the correct structure. If we don't no. have the correct structure, it will always be challenging for them. John, you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, and, and I mean, I agree. I mean, I've seen swimming, and, and I mean, when I follow it, I look at the times, and I look at compared to the times that we were doing back when, when we were competitive swimmers, and it, it's largely unchanged, and it, it feels like we are getting left behind by the rest of the world. So it, it's almost like, okay, what we were doing back then is, is the same thing we're doing now. Um, and, and where does that change happen? I mean, in terms of water polo, if I have to make a recommendation, I, I do think it needs to focus on on the juniors. I mean, this is unfavorable as a, a senior polo player. And I mean, perhaps I may, I know you, I know you put me as a retired water polo player, but I mean, I, I think there's still some stuff left and I do still enjoy playing the game. Re, re, retire, I put retired T and T water polo, not water polo player. <laughs> a big difference. I, I do think the focus comes at the youth and, and that is where we, could build for the future, essentially. Um, I mean, pumping funds into the senior team, which has been dormant for a long time, is probably not the best use. So you, you do focus and you hope you could take a junior team from the 11 to 12 level all the way up to senior, and then that allows you cascading all the way back down. So as they progress, they also get in there. The juniors below them, they're building them up, and you, you now build your sport. So basically, 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 tell me, you tell me the senior team lost. No, it, no. It, it needs funding throughout, right? Because you can't, you can't expect. Okay, so junior players coming up, they are getting funded, and it, your expectation is that they will continue in the sport. However, when they see at the senior level nothing is happening, the motivation, they say, okay, time for me to exit. That's what that's what has happened quite often. It's a question. Do you want to be competitive at the Caribbean level or do you want to be competitive on, at the world stage? So, yes, you could keep funding equally across the board and, and we could probably always remain competitive in the Caribbean. But I think that's a Caribbean water polo problem and that's not, it's not what the rest of the world is. I, 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 can't be, I can't be satisfied with being the best age group team in the Caribbean. You know, if he's the yeah. best, he's the best. You understand? And I mean, so a, a, a lot of times, I mean, on the swimming side of it, you know, see, it, it's a similar dilemma. I mean, it's just not this amount of people because our water polo team is a lot of more people, right? But this, you find there's a, after the age group swimming, there's a little um, window where, okay, so how am I going to get to the Olympics if I don't have that kind of support? And mm -hmm. to me, this thing requires a, a, a whole culture change. Yes. Which I think right now, swimming and water are the same end of life. I mean, you either go to university and you continue, or it ends when you finish secondary school. And especially in water polo, it's, it's very difficult for those people. We had a couple of people that, that went through UE, and I mean, kudos to them to, to stick in with the sport. But I mean, if I didn't have those consistent games throughout my college career, it would be very difficult to stay in the sport because you know that okay i'm training for this and i have 
the opportunity to showcase my talent once every four years or once every two years. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Can we use a uh, learn to swim system or implement some kind of a better learn to swim system to get more persons in swimming and water polo? Anybody? Uh, I, I think that. And I think I think it's beneficial. I think that's what helped me in swimming. And I mean, if it wasn't for water polo, I don't know if I would ever have become the swimmer that I that I became. Um, I would have most likely lost interest. Um, no, no. What, what, I'm, what, what I'm asking, you learn to swim level as in the beginning stage, you learn to swim. So what I'm asking is, is expanding can expanding persons who are learning to swim help with water polo? Definitely, because you want you want to make sure that you have because you want to make sure you have basics. And I've heard on this program so many times people talk about you know the basics that any athlete needs to have from a very young age. All right, and those skills need to be developed. So whether when you go into learn to swim, whether you're going into swimming afterwards, artistic swimming, diving, water polo, those basic skills should be there so that you could. And, and you have enough of those so that you have enough feed for those programs. So definitely expanding the, the, the learn to swim will definitely help um, for all the aquatic disciplines. However, they need to know about the aquatic disciplines. And too often, everybody in learn to swim is just knows, okay, competitive swimming. No, I don't want to do that. Some want to do it, some don't. And then that's it. You know, they don't realize that there are other avenues that you could pursue in terms of aquatics. So how how can, okay, I mean, Ryan, you run a, a club, right? So how can we fix that? Is it that we have to get out to different, if we want to grow the sport and, I mean, a lot of us do it part-time, some people do it full-time. Is it that we too have to up our marketing game and liaise with these learn to swim persons and say, hey, Hey, what I mean, we we, can, we want water polo to build. We want our club. If we had to be selfish, we want our club to build, right? Um, can we work out some kind of synergy, some kind of partnerships to get a flow from the Ulun to swim straight up to the water, straight to water polo? Correct. Yes. So that 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 is definitely something that can be done. So we have partnerships with Learn to Swim programs, all right. And 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 I know there are some that some Learn to Swim programs that actually encourage children to go into swimming or water polo. All right. Um, but yeah, so definitely we need to do that. And definitely marketing will always be helpful because the more people know about water polo in the country is the more likely they will be asking about it. Unfortunately, where we have areas where there's no water polo outside the West. All right. You may have people who will say, OK, well, no, that's I, I can't go there um, and there's nothing available to me there. So then they start looking at other options. And that's the reality of it as it is right now. So that also needs to change. What, what can, how can we incentivize for West people to come up in East? Do you need a passport or something? Just give us pool time. <laughs> so you're saying once you get pool time, once you get pool time, you're going to make it happen. Jason, I already, have, I already have a coach for your pool. <laughs> yeah, you, you're like, you don't talk private business. You know? <laughs> <laughs> people who are willing to come and coach at your pool. All right, but well, if we can, if we can get the pools open in the first place, yeah, right. So if, if we don't have the pool time um there to be able to to sustain a program, then you know we can't do anything. All right, but if we do have it, um we have people who come from from east and central. They come all the way to Puerto Spain for water polo. All right, and um they're willing to to start programs in those pools once it's available. Once you have, they get pool time available. And let's be honest, Jason. I mean, I don't think swimming is for everyone. There's, there's going through your, I mean, as a coach and you see it, you, you know the people that are interested, the people that are there just because their parents are making them do a sport or keeping them occupied. They prefer to be somewhere else. And, and sometimes water polo is that, that option. And I, I know many people who, I mean, started off as swimming, disinterested, went to water polo, loved it and stayed in a sport for a lot longer. Um, I mean, in the end, looking at this being primarily age group sports right now, I mean, even if you're not building professional teams, I mean, you're, you're building professional people and then you actually are making better individuals out of out of the youth. I mean, between the swimming and the water polo, keeping them occupied and just harboring disciplines and, and, and giving in these life lessons 
pain in a competitive sport. Somebody asked, I seen somebody in the chat here asking for a priority bus route pass so that it could come up. I mean, I don't think we reach, we, I don't think we reach there in sports. But, and somebody mentioned <laughs> money because it have to be worth their while. I mean, at the end of the day, unfortunately, a, a lot of persons are volunteers in the sports. I mean, they be real. A lot of, a lot, I'm sure there are some parents who sometimes don't even want to pay the fees and pay them on time. And comparatively, you know, <laughs> to, to other regions, I mean, I'm sure the fees are, are cheap. Yes. So we have our next problem because, I mean, if somebody have to come from town to come up in the east, I mean, they, they have to have to have a love for it first before we have to get that to that point of paying the, 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 the amount that the coaches are worth. Yeah, well, there, there are definitely a lot of people in water polo that love water polo. Uh, most water polo players love water polo. You see, like this this time when they can't train, they are pressure. like, yeah, it's real pressure for them because they love water polo so much. They just want to be in the water because it's a fun sport, all right? Um, that they can that they can excel at. Um, but that priority bus route um, comment, interestingly enough, this morning, just this morning, I was talking about. Um, if the country wants to get serious about sport tourism, all right, we have facilities, but getting to the facilities is a challenge. So they need to look at alternate methods of being able to get to those facilities. For example, let's look at the, the Coover facilities um, that we have, the site in Velodrome, the National Aquatic Center, for example. Um, if you want to get there, if you're living in certain parts of the country, you're going to take forever to get there, right? Um, so maybe we need to look at a system that gets you through the traffic easier all right whether it is a a transportation system for the athletes where they have maybe perhaps we put a bus lane all right um this was the recommendation i got this morning in a conversation with someone so you have like columbia has a bus lane so you go on a bus so you have an athlete's bus that take you through that bus lane and everybody normal traffic continues in the other lanes and you have a a bus lane uh, where only buses will be allowed um, in that lane so they don't have the traffic that, that the others and then you have of course fines if you break the law and so on um Ryan, Ryan, I, I had to take a drink there you know, because you reached 20 you reached year 20 50 yeah. or something but we, we have to think we have to think ahead all right um if we had a train system that would have been an easier um solution but of course that yeah that's that's even beyond 2050 right so yeah, so that that, that kind of conversation I, is just an incidental that that comment was put there, and I had that same type of conversation this morning. That you know, do, these are the things that that keep our country back from excelling more at sports. Well, see, we at the point we're gonna start to wrap up the interview. Um, so I have a question: Do I don't know if this is for me, but do local swim coaches give enough? credence to other aquatic disciplines that are not strictly swimming. Ryan? You better you better answer that. <laughs> I can't even I'm not a coach. But I can't <laughs> even, I can't and, um I I would say this sometimes in the past when you go to meetings, I'll be honest, sometimes when water polo come up it's like, oh that's the team, okay good, let them go. Or why are you wasting your time on water polo? That's a waste of time, you know? Right. So, it, 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 in my opinion, we have to have a totally different culture of aquatics, right? In-house. Because we can't, I mean, let me be real. If we can't fix yourself here, we can't expect persons to want to invest in us. I mean, un unfortunately, I'll say that this sport is highly tied to politics, which probably shouldn't be, right? But, I mean, if we can't fix ourselves and fix... Uh, certain structures. How how are we going to go forward? I mean, I know we had a technical director that came here and stayed for two years and went. I mean, I don't know the exact reasons why. What? what? It, it, turn, it goes back again, and, and it can get a little political, but it goes back again to the structure. If we have the proper structure in place. So we have right now in Asset Council members that are swim coaches, all right? Council should focus on the structure of the business of the association, 
right. where our coaches should be part of the technical committees for swimming, water polo, artistic swimming, and so on. And that's where those kind of technical issues are vented out and then brought to the um, to the council that focuses on the vision. Is it in fulfillment of the vision of the association? And that's where that's where it starts. It comes to, to the structure. So I shouldn't have a water polo proposal going for swimming coaches to decide what should happen. Mm. And that is part of the problem. That's a big part of the problem. So it's the, it starts with structure. If the structure is not there, then you know, like a house, if you know if you build a house with no structure, what will happen? We'll go down the river when heavy rains come. So, John, I want to ask you a question, and um, maybe the final question. What can, I mean, you all are not age groupers anymore, right? You all are adults. What can senior players, both past and present, do to help address some of these situations? Yeah. And I think a lot of senior players still would like to play. I mean, coming from the US circuit, the Masters World Pool is, is a big part of a lot of the communities i mean i was in houston and and each city in texas has their own team and they have all these competitions um i touched on it earlier i mean marlins have kicked off a ex-national players to come play on a tuesday thursday and some of the better age group people i mean if royal also had a, a same thing where right? different days of the week and essentially you now have full weeks there of one senior players getting back in the water they're also integrating with the junior players the junior players are now playing against bigger stronger competition i mean yes they may not be as fast as they used to be but i mean size and water pool is still a very important factor i mean you could slow down an age group uh, if you know what to do um you, you're teaching them new tricks um in that you're developing them so one your club is developing you're getting better players the senior players have a place to play and at the same time perhaps you keep a senior team it may not be an elite senior team at this point but you're keeping a senior team active and as these age groupers come on i mean these senior players will eventually not be able to make a team anymore because the, the crop of players is that good um you, you're, you're improving the entire crop across the country all the west and um Hopefully, in several years out, you have a very competitive team to compete regionally and globally. So it, yeah. it's a place for people to play. Um, there's a lot of people who want to play. And again, the clubs are age group clubs, large by and large. I mean, as a senior player, I'm not going to go and join one of the age group teams because I might be a 35-year-old surrounded by a bunch of 16 and 17-year-olds. And I mean, that's might not be i mean the best thing i mean it's not a joy for me i want to play with people my age and people i played with and you reminisce on the times and you have a, a, a core of people doing that and then you have junior players in ways boy i wish we could live up to those kind of hypes and and then they create their own dreams and then going out in future i mean they they, they do the same thing that we're doing now I don't want them to do the same thing we're doing now, because eh? we're talking and crying here. I don't want them to do that. Well, if I may, we have the we have, and, I, and again, it goes back to the West mentality. Yeah, we have a lot of people um, that would like to come and play. We have the aquatic center, national aquatic center, available to us more than we have other pools available to us, and uh, that can happen there. However, you know the West mentality for a lot of people. It is that okay that's too far to go to you know go and chill out and thing on a regular basis you know and come and do what john is suggesting ryan final question to you mm -hmm. what next what next <laughs> wait till covid is finished all right but our national um players our senior players i should say it's not a national team um players but players who train with the intention of going on a national team right. they have been training they're still training during this time because they're allowed um so to, to to some extent but you're only allowed we only allowed five people at the aquatic center at, at any point in time um for training so 
So we're there doing that, we're waiting for the pandemic and our competitions to come up. Next competition is our CC Can Championships, which is going to be next year, which is the qualifier for CAC Games, which will be in 2023. Right? So we have 2022 CC Can is the qualifier for CAC Games in 2023. So basically, that is what next. We want to we want to start having where we have senior teams. And I did it as with, with my club. We've had um for the first time a senior team compete, go overseas and compete um over the last few years. Um, one competition in Barbados and one in um in South Florida. All right. So we're trying to encourage those senior players to keep in competition. All right, and not just national team competition, but also club competition. So I think um, if both clubs could do that, that would also be helpful, all right, to get the, the senior, to keep the senior interest going. No, so I still mean what next? Because what next? <laughs> what next? <laughs> we we prepare for CC can. That is what is next right now. You mean in so, terms well, of as in, what means? Uh, how can we collectively alleviate some of these problems? That's what I meant for the what next. Yeah. We so we 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 have we have to in, instill organizational change from us at level go down. I think that, I mean, that way and, has, I mean, and in the meantime fix what is within our control within our is, exactly what is what what we're able to do. We keep pushing to try to get uh, more development at the primary school and secondary school um, level. We try to spread the um, the sport throughout the country which through the primary school is actually the probably going to be the easiest way um to get the to get it known in the country um so we we need to look at that angle and develop from there because you know people like competition they don't just want to know the training for nothing so if they have a primary school they get it into the primary schools throughout the country and get them involved in having in having those um competitions and knowing about the sport so i'd like to turn John Little Page and Ryan Smith. Well, let me go and look for the only water polo jersey I have. Right? <laughs> you want a cup. Yes. Uh, the only one I have. Um, but oh, and Ryan, I want I think to that was John's that. last competition. Pardon? I think that was John's last um, national team. Was it? Actually, didn't do you want a cup. I did um, the CC Can. CC Can and Grenade. So I ended on a home tournament. Oh, okay, right. So I'd like to thank John Little Page for his time this evening and Ryan Smith and Ryan Smith too also. Um, thank you for your contribution to Water Polo. I know you keep at it and you keep at it and you keep at it regardless, but what I have to say is keep on keeping at it. Keep up your resilience. Thanks, Jason, and thanks for having this program. At least, you know, we get an opportunity to get out there. Yeah, so later on, we'll post it up on the pages and the we also supposed to have a little um, interview that a pre-recorded interview to play, but we'll post it up on our Facebook pages. We'll share it with you all too, so you can share it with any community. All right? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, John. Thank you for all the persons who tuned in for this water polo discussion on Chlorine Kalaloo, and see you again next week. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jason. Good night.